Howdy, welcome to Free Speech Zone. I'm Bill Olson, and this is episode 22 this year, I think. Is that right, 22? I think I got that right. Anyway, uh, we're going to be talking, you know, there's so many subjects, so many wars going on around the world, so many conflicts, that it's impossible. I'm, I'm not a news agency. I'm one person. I can't follow everything. I, you have to specialize a little bit. And if I didn't specialize a little bit, I wouldn't be worth it. I, you know, if, I, if some people think I am, anyway... But uh, here's the deal. Um, we've got deliberate wars encircling Russia, and, you know, going on in the Ukraine and all that. And I haven't, I'm really not an expert whatsoever on that subject, so I've been ignoring it. But it's getting in your face now. And, it, and if you look at the map, you'll see that what it is, it's an extension of the original threat that NATO posed to Russia of encircling Russia you know, they're just afraid of the West. They're just as afraid of the West as we were of them, actually more so, and rightfully so. Um, we would raise bloody H if we had Russia encircling us. In fact, you, if you recall the, you know, the Cuban Missile Incident, 1961, 62, 60, whatever it was, uh, that was just one place that a missile site was near us. We are completely encircling Russia and China. I mean, what's with that? How, how do we get away with it? And it's a double standard, not a lot. Well, it, it reminds me, wasn't it Colombia, uh, they, when they were asked if, you know, we, they were told the United States wanted to build another permanent military base in their country. And uh, it was either that or Bolivia. God, I'm really a great news source, right? But you, you, you can find it. And, but what they said was that... Uh, We'll let you build one in our country if you let us build one in your country. Yeah, they, how about a Colombian or Bolivian military base right next to Washington, D.C.? Yeah, well, of course, that didn't go over very well. Well, anyway, so that's something to be concerned about, and you, you should probably pay attention to that, definitely, anyway. Uh, Putin seems to be the only rational person in leadership anywhere, uh, I might even be getting that wrong. Like I said, I have really nothing to understand except when you see a full court press by our media attacking Putin, you know that Putin's got to have something good going for him or they wouldn't be attacking him. Uh, well, anyway, but what, what's more significant right now is just recently the, uh, the Palestinians in Gaza and it, uh, joined the International Criminal Court. They were accepted in as a full-fledged member, a country, not just a colony, not an open-air prison colony, but as a full-fledged sovereign country. And the first thing they did was file war crimes against Israel. Well, of course, that's been going on for a while, but what just happened, the United Nations released a report about Israeli war crimes against the Palestinians in this last attack on Gaza. And it's really quite explanatory, and it really covers it well. But here's the thing. Uh, well, as you're going to see in this next video, we get down to the end, and Michael Ratner, who's with the Real News Network doing the analysis, he's pointing out that if the International Criminal Court doesn't take that UN document as an enabling document to prosecute Israel, then the ICC will lose all of its validity. It will have no, no validity anywhere if it doesn't follow up on that. For years and years and years, Israel has been committing absolute crimes. Even putting settlers in the occupied area is a war crime. That's against the law. Sorry, but that's just the way it is. You folks that think Israel is so great, you're wrong. Israel is the violent aggressor in this situation. In fact, Israel, it, it, the, the bottom line comes down to like, uh, um, I'm trying, <laughs> I had a mental block on this guy, but he was saying, what gave Israel, or what gave Great Britain the right to give somebody else's land to a third party? They gave somebody else's land to the refugees coming from World War II, and European Jewish refugees. I might add, by the way, that they didn't have any blood relation to the Jews of the Bible, which is how they base God gave us Israel. 
Well, I thought it was the Balfour Declaration and, and following things, but they say it was God that did it. But God gave it to the Israelis back then who have no relationship with the Israelis now, none. I mean, it was as if I suddenly said, I'm an Israeli, I'm a Jew, so I get to go and take the Israeli land, you know, kick a Palestinian out and build my house because I'm a Jew. I just said so. That's what the Israelis are doing. They're, they're claiming to be somehow related to those Jews at that time, which is all n nothing to do with anything because even if they were related, so what? It's a ridiculous thing to say God gave me this country 6,000 years, 2,000 years ago, whatever it was, and that now you can come back after all this time, after all everything's changed, and kick somebody else out because you've finally read something in your Bible or something? Get out of here. I mean, God. Okay, well, we're going to go ahead and play this clip. It's a, about a 14-minute clip. Michael Ratner on the Real News Network talking about the UNN, the, the United Nations uh, report. So let's, let, let's watch this. Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Jessica Devereaux in Baltimore, and welcome to this edition of the Ratner Report. Now joining us is the man behind the report, Michael Ratner. He is the President Emeritus for the Center for Constitutional Rights, and he's also a board member for the Real News, and of course, he's a regular contributor. Thanks for joining us, Michael. Good to be with The Real News and with you, Jessica. So, Michael, we have this UN report that came out about the war um, between Gaza and Israel back in the summer of 2014. I know you've been tracking it quite closely. What are some highlights? What have you picked up from this report? Well, you know, what I'm left with and what I'm at today, really, is how much longer is the world, and particularly the United States, uh, going to facilitate and enable Israel in these periodic you know, bloodlettings that they engage in in Gaza. And this report, hopefully, like some of the other ones, is beginning to close that window on Israel. And hopefully, you know, Israeli officials won't have impunity forever uh, for the murders and killings and devastation in Gaza. Uh, but let's talk about this report. Last week, uh, the commission to investigate uh, the violations of the laws of war uh, and human rights violations in the Gaza Strip in 2014 during the war, reported back to the UN Human Rights Commission, which can then decide what to do with the report and ultimately go to the Security Council. But what that commission was appointed to do was investigate an operation of the Israelis called Protective Edge. Now, I want to put that in a context. It's the third such military operation by Israel in the last seven years, major military assaults on Gaza, which is essentially an open air prison surrounded by Israel, uh, airspace controlled by Israel, an occupied territory, even though there's no actual Israeli troops on the ground most of the time. Uh, this is the third such operation. Operation Cast Lead, which we thought would be the end of this kind of thing because it was so horrible, was in 2008 and 2009. Uh, and Operation Pillar of Defen Defense, well, mowing the lawn, as if killing thousands of Palestinians is essentially uh, like cutting the grass. Cast lead, and I've given reports on real news on that, which was 2008-2009, resulted in 1,300 Palestinians killed. The majority were civilians, 5,000 wounded. Compare that to what happened to Israel. 13 Israelis killed, only three of which were civilians. It resulted in an earlier report analogous to this one. That one became famous. It was uh, called the Goldstone Report. Uh, former Justice Goldstone wrote that report. It was condemned what was going on, particularly in the occupied territories, essentially called it apartheid, uh, and documented the slaughter that Israel had engaged in during that 2008-2009 uh, cast-led assault on Gaza. However, because of pressure from the United States, uh, particularly, uh, Judge Goldstone started to retract on some of his findings. Of course, it didn't really mean much. The report was out. The other commissioners didn't retract. It was sort of, you know, it's hard to say, but uh, to some extent, it just seems like he bowed to the pressure uh, to perhaps uh, not be an outcast in his own uh, community. In any case, that was a report 
uh, condemned what Israel had done. Uh, many people did not think it could happen again. Uh, but of course it did. It did last summer. It began on June 13th, the Israeli assault on Gaza called uh, Protective Edge. And this time the numbers were even worse. 2,131 killed, perhaps more, of which 1,473 were civilians and 500 children. The UN Commission report, which came out last week, uh, gave a figure and roughly analogous. 65% civilians were killed. That's an astounding figure in a war. Uh, there are, of course, civilians are often killed in war. But when it's like that, it makes you question, was, was Israel intentionally targeting civilians? The answer to that, always disputed. Uh, in the Goldstone report, initially it was said they were. Goldstone retracted, but the report still stands. In this report, without saying that explicitly, you can draw the conclusion that on a number of occasions, uh, civilians were intentionally targeted. Compare that 2100 figure to the Israeli figure. Uh, 71 Israelis were killed, 55 soldiers, and five civilians. So less than 10% civilians compared to 65% or over. And as the report said, and it's devastating really, uh, in Gaza, and I'm quoting from it, in Gaza, the scale of devastation was unprecedented. Unprecedented. The killed, the injured, and the infrastructure destroyed. 18,000 houses, 80,000 damaged. Uh, so it's a very strong report documenting what Israel did and, and saying Israel had to be held accountable for it. And it also talked about, and this is important, like the Goldstone report, it put this attack and really the response of the Palestinians into the context of the occupation, which has been going on since 1967, uh, the settlements which have been continuing even as we speak, the house destructions going on in the occupied territories, uh, the prisons and the treatment of prisoners uh, with cruel, inhuman, uh, and degrading treatment during this period. Uh, and it talked about war crimes uh, based on proportionality. You can't uh, kill more civilians than are necessary uh, to achieve your military goal, and you have to distinguish between civilians and military. Um, so it talks a lot about that. It's a good report. A critique of the report that I have is that it, not that it talks about Palestinian armed groups and what they did. Yes, they sent rockets into Israel, um, and there were tunnels, although it's not clear that those tunnels were used for any purpose other than for people to go through, soldiers to go through and attack uh, Israeli targets, and not on a great level. Um, but it talks about what Palestine did. Uh, unfortunately, to me, it begins the report with what the Palestinian armed groups, as it refers to them, uh, are called. Uh, and the problem of the report is it looks at them as if there's some symmetry between what Israel did and what the Palestinians do did. Of course, there's not. Clearly, as I pointed out, there's not that in terms of numbers and destruction. Uh, very little was destroyed in Israel. The numbers were, you know, any killed, any killed person is serious. Uh, but how do you, cons you compare a uh, number in its 70s to a number over 2,000? So nothing close. So you can't make a symmetry out of uh, what, was, what occurred, the way the war was fought, etc. But you also can't have symmetry in terms of context. In one case, Israel is the occupier. Israel is the oppressor. And the other is the oppressed and the occupied. You get rid of the occupation and you won't have the need to resist it. The problem with the report making any kind of symmetry between those two is it plays into the Israeli and to a certain extent, and the U.S. narrative, uh, that somehow Israel, with the support of the U.S., has the right to defend itself. In fact, of course, uh, it's the occupied people who have the right to resist occupation. Uh, Israel, what it should be doing um, is ending the occupation. If, in fact, Israel obeyed international law, followed UN resolutions, uh, the occupation would long be over and there wouldn't be need, and there never has been a need, but Israel wouldn't feel it has any need, and of course I don't think it does, uh, to do what it has done in Gaza. Despite this drawback, it's still an important report. It's another document by neutral observer or neutral observers of Israeli war crimes. 
There's been three, there's been responses to it. Uh, the U.S. gave one of the more sickening press conferences I've ever looked at. Uh, the U.S. essentially is an ostrich or ostrich-like. They said there's no more need for the U.N. to do anything here. There's a bias against Israel, et cetera, ignoring the war crimes documented in the report. And let's just remember this. The U.S., with, with its over $3 billion a year, is an enabler of Israeli war crimes. It continues to support Israel with military weapons, uh, despite knowing it's, cre it's committing serious, serious human rights violations. When Israel is Israeli officials are finally put into the dock, U.S. officials, I hope, will be going along with them. Israel's response was simply to not cooperate again with the U.N. commission. They simply don't respond, not to any letters. They won't cooperate, uh, claiming that there's bias against Israel. And then in their actual response, they said, uh, Israel acted morally. It has moral behavior, and it's terror that it's confronted, and it's been moral in that. Well, that's a complete reversal. Um, the terror here is being committed by Israel, not by the Palestinians. And then they claim Israel is a democracy. Well, apart from lots of disputes on that and what happens within Israel and the fact that there's you know, millions of Palestinians who can't vote uh, in any election that Israel has, um, how does a democracy uh, justify uh, the slaughter that is taking place in Gaza? The question is, what's next? What's next is this commission report will go to the Human Rights Council. It may well be, will likely be approved there, I hope. Uh, then it could go to the Security Council. Uh, but the problem in the Security Council is the United States has a veto. It looms large over it. And the Security Council will therefore be able to do nothing about carrying this report forward to accountability. The Security, the security Council could refer the report and Israeli violations as well as Palestinian violations to the International Criminal Court. The U.S. will prohibit that. And finally, let's talk about the International Criminal Court. Palestine, I hope as most of our viewers know, because it's important, joined that court a few months ago. It was recognized in April as a member of the International Criminal Court. And it's recognized as a state by the UN and the majority of countries in the world. Israel has not joined the International Criminal Court, nor has the United States. But unfortunately for Israel, crimes on Palestinian territory can be investigated by the International Criminal Court because Palestine is a member. And today, just as I'm giving this report, there's important news. The prosecutor at the criminal court had asked for information from both sides, Israel and Palestine, on what happened in Gaza. And today, Palestine submitted hundreds, perhaps thousands of pages of reports uh, on what the war crimes of Israel and Palestinian territory. Israel, of course, did nothing, did not submit anything. And it did it in three areas. First, in what we've been talking about, uh, the report on the way this war was fought, Protective Edge. Um, and it talked about the war crimes that were committed, the thousands of civilians killed, uh, and the destruction of tens of thousands of houses. Uh, and that report was that's aspect one of what it submitted to the ICC. Aspect two was the torture and cruel and human and degrading treatment of prisoners, detainees in Israeli jails many without charges. And thirdly, and this is important, and I want to end on this point, that they also submitted to the International Criminal Court the question of the settlements. And the settlements, which are, of course, in occupied territory, are absolutely 100 percent slam dunk illegal. Uh, they're a war crime. There's no real defense for them. You're not allowed to put settlers of your own country into occupied territories. And the question remaining now is, will the prosecutor in the International Criminal Court open a full-scale investigation? If she doesn't, in my view, it will end any legitimacy that court has left. Um, so let's hope she does. Unfortunately, time uh, is, running, uh, is running as she considers it, uh, and it can take a long time at the International Criminal Court during that period, uh, Operations like uh, the assault on Gaza could happen again. Uh, perhaps if the prosecutor acts rapidly, it will dissuade the Israelis uh, from entering into another Gaza war. Let's just hope so. 
So there's movement. It's much slower, I think, than the Palestinians need or deserve. Uh, but hopefully it, it will make a difference. All right. Michael Ratner joining us from New York. Thank you so much for being with us. And thank you for having me on The Real News. And okay. Well, uh, we'll just have to wait and see because I've... It's always bothered me that the UN makes resolution after resolution, and of course, the permanent seats on the Security Council, which shouldn't be permanent, you know, well, anyway, U.S. continually vetoes it. And didn't I just see some senator, some, some one of the less desirables was saying, hey, elect me because I will honestly say that I am for the state of Israel uh, without being embarrassed, blah, blah, blah. You should be embarrassed. Support it. Well, I guess what it is is birds of a feather stick together. We're the number one terrorist organization in the world, and I guess that would make Israel number two. I guess we should stay together. Well, anyway, uh, how about national surveillance? We just had a convention that happens every year. It's the Henry A. Wallace National Security Convention. And uh, speakers on different subjects. But let's hear what Glenn Greenwald had to say. He's, I, I love Glenn Greenwald. Right on. Let's hear him. Glenn Greenwald brought us the Snowden revelations about the national security state. But secrecy is a bigger problem than one whistleblower and one agency. How does secrecy threaten democracy itself? Welcome to the Henry A. Wallace National Security Forum. I'm Sonali Kohatkar. Perhaps no one has stirred the pot more on the reach of the national security state than journalist Glenn Greenwald when he released information provided by whistleblower Edward Snowden. Americans learned that the NSA was spying on everyone and even sharing that data with other agencies like the DEA. What we want to explore today is not just the programs at the NSA, but how and why secretive programs undermine our democracy. Joining me now is Glenn Greenwald. Welcome to the program, Glenn. Great to be with you. Thank you. So the NSA claims that they are collecting all of this data on all of us with the mandate to keep us all safer. But are they actually accomplishing that? Not at all. I mean, if you look at the successful terrorist attacks like the one that was carried out at the Boston Marathon, it's almost impossible to find any evidence of these NSA programs actually stopping any terror plots. And if you look even going back all the way 10 years ago to the 9-11 Commission, what they concluded about why the U.S. government failed to stop the 9-11 attack was not because they had failed to collect enough intelligence, quite the contrary, they said that the government had collected more than enough intelligence to be able to know the attack was coming, but that they had, they had so much in their possession that they failed to proverbially connect the dots to know what it is that they had. And their solution or their response to that conclusion was to simply try and collect more. In fact, in the words of the NSA documents, their goal was to collect it all, to collect the entire internet. And as you suggest, when you're collecting everything, it's almost impossible to find the things they claim they're looking for, which are people who are planning terrorist attacks or other violent crime. Now, it's quite widely known that the NSA stores all of the um, massive amounts of data that it collects in certain data centers, for example, in Utah. But doesn't that, uh, just the fact that it's all sitting there in this central location or in a number of central locations, doesn't it result in a risk, particularly uh, in terms of cybersecurity and the threats that uh, these sorts of data centers might be under? It's a really good point, actually, and one that's often overlooked. Um, you know, Edward Snowden was just a single individual who didn't even work for the NSA. He actually worked for an outside contractor, Booz Allen Hamilton, and yet he had access to extraordinary amounts of information. And there are millions of people, literally, with top secret access and clearance inside the U.S. government. Um, just that alone poses a huge threat. Um, but it's not just the insider threat, as you suggest, it's also... Uh, foreign governments, adversary governments, it's stateless groups, it's hackers. Um, when you take that amount of sensitive information, namely our communications and the communication of the people around the world, and digitally store them in one place, you absolutely inherently um, are vulnerable to attack. And it can be a massive invasion of people's privacy on all kinds of levels. Now, Glenn, are there economic costs associated with the national security state, with what the NSA is doing? And is there, uh, do you have a sense of how far the NSA is willing to go to pay a price under the auspices of national security? 
Well, there's an enormous price just in terms of the budget. Um, you know, people like to make the point that Russia and China and, and Iran um, and every other country essentially on the planet engages in electronic surveillance, and that's true, but nobody does it near to the extent of the United States, and that's just simply be a question of resources. We spend so much more on the NSA or electronic surveillance than any other country by far, billions and billions of dollars a year. So that right there is an enormous cost. But then there's the cost of when people find out that this spying is, being, is, is taking place, people will no longer trust the American tech sector. Now, here in the United States, the NSA justifies its spying, saying they're, they're essentially protecting the country from uh, those who are doing something wrong, people who have something to hide, the bad folks. And we know historically, for example, the FBI spied on civil rights activists, on Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and, and today, uh, on anti-war activists and environmentalists, we see this continuing uh, as if these are people who are doing something wrong. How do you respond to that? There's two points worth making about that. Number one is when we talk about somebody doing something wrong, many different people mean very different things when they talk about someone doing something wrong. We might mean somebody who's planning an attack to blow up a building or a subway train and kill lots of civilians, but people in power tend to view anyone who challenges their power as doing something wrong. The other point worth making is that a surveillance state affects everybody, not just the people who are, quote, doing anything wrong, whatever we might mean by that. Just the knowledge that you might be watched or monitored means that you change your behavior in all kinds of ways. There are all kinds of psychological studies showing that people become much more conformist and cautious and afraid. Um, they make much more limited choices whenever they perceive that they might be monitored as opposed to when they believe they can act without being watched. And so a surveillance society is really a conformist society, which is why almost every government craves surveillance. Now, Glenn, does, it, does the NSA's approach to national security have the uh, opposite effect that citizens who might be afraid of landing up on a watch list might be more reluctant to actually report on real national security threats if they see something? It has a deterrent effect in, in all kinds of ways. Um, and, you know, that's one of the ironies is after 9-11, the U.S. government believed that one of the critical objectives for being able to stop terrorism and to find extremists who are actually dangerous was to work closely and in collaboration with the Muslim American community and American Muslim leaders around the country. And yet everything the U.S. government has done over the past 13 years has been designed to do the opposite, to break any trust, to make any kind of collaboration impossible. I mean, if a community knows that the government is spying on it pervasively, that they're infiltrating it, that they perceive it as a threat, all of which the U.S. government has done, that if you say the, even a slightly wrong thing at one point about your political views, you could get onto a radar of the government or even a watch list or be accused of terrorism. No member of that community is going to want to cooperate in any way with the U.S. government. Can you tell us a little bit more about how the efforts to, uh, to plant uh, surveillance mechanisms within our technology may have actually made the internet a place that's much more susceptible to actually be attacked and, and, and create greater dangers. We talk a lot in the wake of the Snowden revelations about encryption, the idea that you use certain means to protect your emails or your chats um, if you want to protect it from being monitored. But encryption is actually something that's extremely important to how the internet functions. Everybody uses encryption even though they don't know it. What the NSA has been doing is deliberately weakening those encryption protocols. They have been finding and exploiting flaws in them. They put back doors in them to enable themselves to be able to break through the encryption in, or, in order to get into it. The problem is, is that when you create a back door, even if you're comfortable with having the NSA do it, and none of us should be, but even if you are, when you create a back door into a building or into a, a, a virtual building, it's not only you that gets to enter it, it's other people, so other governments, um, stateless groups, hackers who might be a lot more malicious even, um, are able to enter that as well, or just individuals with a high level of knowledge of how the internet works. And so it makes the entire system of encryption much weaker and therefore weakens the internet as a whole. 
Glenn, how unprecedented is the reach of the NSA's surveillance state? Just if you look not only at U.S. history, but world history, that this one institution is able to pry into the lives of people the world over. Has any institution ever come even close to what the NSA is doing? The internet itself is an unprecedented tool. We do so much more on the internet and centralize so much more of our lives in one place than ever before. And if you think about what the explicit goal of the US government and their allies in this Five Eyes Alliance are, the UK, Australia, Canada, and New Zealand, they explicitly say that their goal is to collect it all, to turn the internet into a place where there's literally no privacy, where every communication, every transaction, every activity is collected, stored, and then ultimately monitored when they want by these governments. And there's nothing, been nothing like the internet, and there's certainly been nothing like the level of surveillance that this kind of indiscriminate spying permits. Glenn Greenwald, thank you so much. Great to be with you. Thank you. On the next episode of the Henry A. Wallace and okay, right. okay, well, um, what we see is continuous, complete monitoring, complete recording of every facet of our digital life. And very soon you're going to see, we'll, we'll have another video on that one, hopefully here in a little while on Google. Uh, and their Google Chrome has a little black box module in, in its software that you download when you use Google Chrome, and that turns on your microphone and camera, and then it records it for, you know, austerity? I don't know. Nobody knows. It's part of the voice recognition thing that Google's doing. But before we get into that, I want to get into something that's, you know, they're all serious issues, but this one is an overbearingly serious issue. It's the, the fact that we are privatizing nuclear war in such a way that, you know, as long as it makes money, we're going to do it. It's, it's amazing that that's the only consideration we have. They've just changed the classification of certain nukes to, uh, you know, so that they can be used in the conventional warfare mode as one of their tools. Well, we're just going to go ahead and play this one. This is called Privatizing Nuclear War. It's another uh, Michael Chusadovsky report. With tensions growing in Europe, Asia, and the Middle East, a new generation of nuclear weapons technology is making nuclear warfare a very real prospect. And with very little fanfare, the U.S. is embarking on the privatization of nuclear war under a first-strike doctrine. This is the GRTV Backgrounder on Global Research TV. From the dawn of the atomic age until the fall of the Soviet Union, the specter of nuclear apocalypse hung over the world. Families prepared fallout shelters. Children were trained to run, duck, and cover. The Dr. Strangeloves of the Rand Corporation talked about winnable nuclear wars, and the public was taught about the doctrine of mutually assured destruction. But that was the Cold War, a relic of a bygone age. Or so we thought. As tensions between Russia and the West mount, NATO is changing its posture, showing off its capabilities in maneuvers like this recent amphibious assault exercise in Sweden involving American forces. And the U.S. is also planning to station weapons, including tanks and fighting vehicles in Eastern European NATO member countries for the first time since the end of the Cold War. This year, our nuclear forces will receive more than 40 intercontinental ballistic missiles capable of penetrating all existing missile defenses, even the most advanced. The two massive B-2s soared 6,500 miles from Missouri to drop dummy weapons on a bombing range west of South Korea and less than 50 miles from the North Korean border, and then flew back to the U.S. It was the first time the U.S. military has confirmed a B-2 practice mission, but the message was clear. The B-2 is capable of dropping 16 nuclear bombs, each on a different target. Obama brands his system the stronger, smarter, and swifter version of Ronald Reagan's initial Star Wars program. Under the plan, the U.S. attacks Russia with nuclear weapons, while NATO missile defense in Eastern Europe mops up any attempted response. 
As is only becoming apparent now in the light of recent tensions between NATO and Russia, neither the US nor Russia ever had any genuine intention of abandoning their nuclear capability. In fact, unbeknownst to most of the public, the US took a bold new step in 2001 when a nuclear posture review report, approved by the Senate in 2002, affirmed an offensive, first-strike nuclear capability as a central pillar of U.S. defense. Since that time, it has become obvious that one of the major targets of this nuclear posture is Russia, but it is by no means the only one. The targeting of China and Russia dates back to the Cold War era, and in that regard, there hasn't been any major shift. Well, there's maybe a change in the diplomatic environment, But in effect, today, uh, U.S. um, decision makers are contemplating the use of nuclear weapons against against, uh, Russia. It's it's been stated quite explicitly. If that were to occur, we're in a World War III scenario. In fact, uh, we may even be in a terminal uh, uh, war situation because Russia and the United States have enough weapons to blow up the Earth several times. But what, is this, what I think has to be emphasized is that as a result of the 2001 Nuclear Posture Review, the United States has defined a new doctrine whereby they can use nuclear weapons against non-nuclear states, particularly targeting uh, countries like Iraq. It was stated in 2003 by Rumsfeld, Iraq, Syria, Libya, and so on. And if we look at the history of these so-called tactical nuclear weapons, so-called mini-nukes, small uh, nuclear weapons, which are similar to the thermonuclear bombs with a lower explosive capacity, but if you look at the statements of U.S. policymakers, they present these mini-nukes, in a sense, as peacemaking bombs, uh, harmless to the surrounding civilian population and they justify their use in the conventional war theater. And this was actually approved by the Senate in 2002, uh, giving the United States military the green light to use uh, nuclear weapons with an explosive capacity varying between one-third and six times the Hiroshima bomb in the conventional war theater without the green light of the commander-in-chief, namely the president of the United States. The supposed threat from Russian and North Korean forces are used to justify the maintenance of the conventional thermonuclear arsenal. The so-called Iranian threat is being used to justify the development and maintenance of the tactical nuclear arsenal. But these are not the real reasons behind this intensification in nuclear panic. The real motivation, quite predictably, goes toward the real goal of these projects, the privatization of nuclear war for geopolitical dominance and financial gain. This can be traced back to a meeting that took place in August 2003 in the wake of the new U.S. Nuclear Posture Review. As described in Michelle Chosodovsky's book, Towards a World War III Scenario, the meeting, convened by the Pentagon at the Strategic Command Headquarters at Offutt Air Force Base in Nebraska, brought together over 150 military contractors and scientists to discuss the development of a new, more politically viable nuclear technology, the so-called bunker busters and mini-nukes of the modern era. In a cruel irony, the participants in this secret meeting, which excluded members of Congress, arrived on the anniversary of Hiroshima and departed on the anniversary of the attack on Nagasaki. The Hiroshima Day 2003 meetings had set the stage for the privatization of nuclear war. Perhaps inevitably, This new era of privatized nuclear war is based on a convenient political fiction. The distinction between the thermonuclear warheads of the Cold War era and the so-called mini-nukes and bunker busters of our own era is an easily demonstrable lie, designed to make the first strike use of nuclear weapons politically acceptable. As the Union of Concerned Scientists demonstrated as far back as 2005, nuclear bunker busters like the B-6111 could still cause widespread radioactive fallout that, in the Middle East theater, would result in hundreds of thousands of deaths. Those um, um, tactical nuclear weapons are fully deployed 
I should say that they are also deployed uh, by several non-nuclear states, which are members of, the, of, of NATO. And I'm talking about Belgium, Holland, Germany, Italy, and Turkey, five non-nuclear states. And they are deployed um, against targets in the Middle East. Uh, and uh, there's nothing which actually excludes their use in the conventional war theater because the decision-making can take place at a much lower level. And not to say that it will take place at a lower level, let's say, of the, let's say the regional commander, US CENTCOM, for instance. But um, we're at a stage where um, military planners believe in their own propaganda uh, they have, uh, first of all, instructed scientists to say that this new generation of nuclear weapons are harmless to the surrounding civilian population because the explosion is underground, referring to the fact that these are bunker buster bombs and there's no danger that people surrounding the, the bomb uh, uh, explosion will actually be affected. Of course, that's a big lie. Uh, but at the same time, that narrative is entered into the military manuals. So we can't, uh, we, we're no longer within the realm of Cold War doctrine, which was based on, um, you know, on the, on the concept of mad, uh, mutual assured destruction. We are in a mad world, but it's not the mad of the Cold War era, okay? And, and, it, and what is contemplated when, uh, when nuclear weapons are envisaged against targets in the Middle East is the fact that, first of all, these countries have no countervailing potential. They're sitting ducks. They can be bombed. So let's go ahead and do it. And, and we do it on humanitarian grounds. It's responsibility to protect. Once again, the world is being whipped up into a nuclear panic as a result of a parade of boogeymen. But you don't think this is going to happen? You think no, I don't. This is not what's going to happen? No, not at all. This threat serves to further the global military agenda of the NATO alliance, even as it lines the pockets of the contractors who have been entrusted with the development of the latest nuclear technologies. And this entire agenda is being overseen by a political, military, and financial class who themselves present the greatest threat to the future of humanity. I suspect that if a tactical nuclear weapon were to be used it would not be publicized. Uh, it, uh, it would be passed off as a conventional weapon. And this is why we don't really have much information on, on the use of these weapons. Uh, I, I, I'm sure, of course, that, that the Russians are fully aware. Um, but um, it's very difficult to predict what would happen um, if one of these um, tactical nuclear weapons were used and if, if su it subsequently became official that they had been used, um, I think that what is at stake is a broader process of military escalation in the Middle East. Um, and essentially, that military escalation also uh, involves targeting Iran. And uh, with regard to the targeting of, of Iran, um, there are certainly plans uh, of deploying, actively deploying tactical nuclear weapons directed at Iran. And it, it's been stated on, on time and again that these would, would disable uh, Iran's nuclear facilities with bunker buster bombs. So we're in a situation where we use nuclear weapons whether they're Israeli or, or from the NATO-US arsenal, to disable a non-existing nuclear um, weapons program using a nuclear weapon, okay? That's where you see how mad these people are. Uh, but if that were to occur, um, I, I think we are, again, we are in a World War Three scenario. Uh, the, similarly, um, for, the, for more than 50 years, the United States has been threatening North Korea with, nu with a nuclear attack, and very openly, okay? And very openly. And again, they, they will say, well, we need to bomb the hell out of them uh, so that we ensure that they don't develop nuclear weapons. 
ironically, if they bomb North Korea, they in, in effect, they also bomb the entire peninsula because, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Uh, uh, Pyongyang is is what uh, something like fifty kilometers from the less than fifty kilometers from the South Korean border, um, you know, like going from uh, from uh, Manhattan to New Jersey, and and so again, uh, military planners are not people who are going to reflect on the geopolitical implications, the broad geopolitical implications of their actions. So uh, for people who say that this is uh, an impossibility, that it cannot happen. I think they have to revise their understanding. And uh, I think that what we have to do is to ensure that these people uh, who are presenting a, a, a nuclear weapons ideology based on preemptive warfare, to ensure that these people are, are, are moved out of office because they're dangerous not only <laughs> to humanity, they're also dangerous to the to the to the United States and and people in the United States because they are acting uh, on their behalf ultimately. The lies of this nuclear era, like the lies of the last, need to be resisted at every level, because as many observers have pointed out over the years, the consequences of nuclear conflict are as inescapable as they are irreversible. In a nuclear war, the collateral damage would be the life of all humanity. For more on this story and other breaking news and current events, please go to globalresearch.ca. For more research and analysis by James Corbett, please go to corbettreport.com. Yeah, and actually do that. Go to corbettreport.com and go to globalresearch.tv also. Um, Really good sites. Now... At the end there, they were showing the the kid, you know, seeing this nuclear bomb go off, so he quickly ducks under the curb. Well, I mean, as ridiculous as it sounds, I mean, we went through that. I was of the age back then, let's see, I guess it was uh, 1959, 1960. I was probably fifth and sixth grade, something like that, probably about eight or nine years old. And my job, when there was a nuclear war, I was to pull the curtains down. All right, that'll protect you from nuclear radiation and the blast force. Well, other kids' jobs were to, you know, make sure the lights are turned off and all sorts of other stuff. And then everybody got underneath their desks. Yep, get underneath those desks, duck and cover. That way, when you're burned to a crisp, you'll have the silhouette of a desk outlined on your body. Okay, (laughs) sorry about that. Anyway, okay, we're going to play a video here. Uh, they, the Supreme Court just upheld Obamacare. And guess what? The only people celebrating were the GMOs, or the, not GMOs, the HMOs. Is that a pretty and slip or what? The health maintenance organizations. And uh, why are they celebrating? Well, we're going to play a video here from the Real News Network, and they're discussing why. <laughs> Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Jessica Devereaux in Baltimore. In a 6-3 to vote, the U.S. Supreme Court rejected a challenge to Obamacare on Thursday. The justices said consumers qualify for a subsidy that lowers the cost of premiums whether they buy their coverage through federal or state exchanges. Chief Justice John Roberts wrote the majority opinion stating, quote, Congress passed the Affordable Care Act to improve health insurance markets, not to destroy them. If at all possible, we must interpret the act in a way that is consistent with the former and avoids the latter. Now joining us to get into all of this is our guest, Dr. Margaret Flowers. Margaret is a pediatrician in the Baltimore area and co-chair of the Maryland Chapter of Physicians for a National Health Program. Thanks for joining us, Margaret. Thank you for having me, Jessica. So, Margaret, do you see this court decision as a real victory for working people? I see it as a victory for those more than 6 million people in 34 states who would have lost the subsidies to their coverage and would have seen their premiums rise by 300 to more than 600 percent without it, that the fact that they won't lose their health care is a plus. But Margaret, I know that you and your organization, you are in favor of a single payer system and your major critiques is that they're skyrocketing costs for everyday folks in terms of premiums, deductibles, co-pays. Can you just explain how the system that Obamacare has set up has accelerated those expenditures for everyday working folks? 
Thank you. Well, it continues to be a market-based private insurance-driven system, and private insurers in the United States really have profit as their bottom line. So they do whatever they can in order to enhance that profit, raising premiums, co-pays, deductibles, restricting access to health professionals or to medications. The competition that was hoped uh, would emerge from the Affordable Care Act has not happened. And in fact, in the federal health exchanges, almost 60% of them only have a choice of one or two health insurers. So when they can dominate the market like that, they're able to charge higher prices. But of course, you know, President Obama came out defending Obamacare once again, and he pointed out to some specific examples of how the program is working. Let's take a look. If you're a parent, you can keep your kids on your plan till they turn 26, something that has covered millions of young people so far. That's because of this law. If you're a senior or an American with a disability, this law gives you discounts on your prescriptions, something that has saved 9 million Americans an average of $1,600 so far. If you're a woman, you can't be charged more than anybody else. Even if you've had cancer or your husband had heart disease or just because you're a woman. So, Margaret, we just heard the president lay out his examples of how Obamacare is really working for working families. Isn't there something to be said about those achievements? Well, again, um, the, those are aspirations and not actually being fulfilled. So while young people can stay on their parents' health insurance, that, in fact, has not reduced the number of young people who are uninsured significantly because it still depends upon whether their parents can afford to carry them on their health insurance plans. When it comes to pre-existing conditions, while insurance companies are not able to exclude patients or you know policyholders on the basis of pre-existing conditions, what they've done on the flip side is to re restrict access to providers by creating narrow and ultra-narrow networks that don't cover many of the major health centers or the specialty types of doctors that patients would need when they actually have a serious health problem. That drives patients to have to go outside of their network where they bear 100% of the cost of their care. So we continue to see these health care barriers. And of course, it's great that women, you know, that we've reduced this, the disparity between health care costs for men and women. But, it, you know, we could do that at well under a single payer system. And under single payer, we wouldn't be leaving 35 million people in America completely out of the system and another 30 or 40 million people who continue to face financial barriers to care. So the reason that we oppose the Affordable Care Act, while we don't support taking anything away from people, is because it just is not a solution that will ever be universal or affordable for everyone. Let's talk about another group that is opposing the Affordable Care Act. That's Republicans, of course. And they were not happy with the court's decision. Senator Lindsey Graham, he took the Senate floor today saying that health care would be the number one issue in the elections in 2016. Margaret, do you see that we need to reform the system that we currently have under Obamacare? Or do we need to completely overturn it like Republicans want? And would your organization be in support of sort of working together with conservatives to get this repealed? When it comes to the Republican approach to health care, we just completely differ. They don't have a real viable solution other than just completely opening it up to the market, which is where we're headed. And we ought to remind ourselves that the basis of the Affordable Care Act came out of a conservative think tank and was first passed by a Republican governor in Massachusetts. So what we're seeing is politicking um, instead of really talking about the policy issues. What we want to see and the fastest way we can do this is just to completely expand Medicare to the entire population, a publicly financed Medicare for all, and then work to improve that system so it has more comprehensive benefits. That's the fastest way to solve this problem. It will cover everybody. It will control health care costs and people won't face out-of-pocket financial barriers to getting the care that they need. But Margaret, could there be a way that we can sort of work with this idea that private health insurance companies, they're not going anywhere in America. They, they're, they're sort of a staple, a, a huge Goliath in, in our world right now. Is there a way that we could work with a different type of model? Let's take, for example, Switzerland. 99.5% of all Swiss citizens are covered. The government subsidizes health care for poor people on sort of a graduated basis, with the goal being that individuals would not spend more than 10% of their income. And uh, according to them, they only spend about 2.7% of their GDP on health care. And um, here in the United States, we're spending about 7.4% of GDP. So could this, sa this could eventually save us money. Would you be in favor of moving towards a system like that? 
You know, I would not be in favor of that. I think that what we're talking about between the United States and Swiss, Switzerland are completely different situations. Switzerland, private health insurance is actually designed and has been for a long time to provide coverage for actual health care. The citizens of Switzerland have a much higher income. They have much uh, better social support for their citizens. So it's completely different than here in the United States where our private health insurers have as their bottom line profit and they don't in fact care about the health of their policy holders. And so we've tried for decades now to regulate this industry and what we see is every time we try, they do an end run around it and health care costs continue to go up and people continue to go out, go without the health care that they need. So again, the fastest way we can do this is to join the many other industrialized nations in the world who have gone to some form of a publicly financed universal you know, single-payer type of healthcare system. All right, Dr. Margaret Flowers, always a pleasure having you on. Thank you for having me, Jessica. Yeah, I was going to say, how about free health care? You know, the plan they have now, they say everybody pays his fair share. That might be true, except for the little factor that they don't tell you. They don't pay you fairly. They make you pay fairly, but they force you into a minimum wage job that can't possibly support that type of expense. And then you're without. I need a hernia operation. Guess what? I have health care through the state of Oregon, a $5,000 copay. So that's just like saying, forget it. You don't get, you don't get the operation. So I'm waiting until I'm 65 and see what Medicare offers me. Now, is that, that's, that's what our great American health care system offers Americans. Are you proud of that? Well, don't be. You know, it, it's amazing. Um, Cuba sent 1,500 doctors to help us with Katrina, and they were the world's best doctors. They were educated in a state that gave them free education and free health care. And America, a much more robust, rich, giant state, can't do it. Aren't we ashamed? Well, we should be. Man, oh man. Well, anyway, it's funny. The difference between our health care and the, the Swedish health care, is that what they're Swedish? Is that they actually provided health care where we provide a profit incentive instead. Uh, so anyway, now you know it. Well, next week we're, the studios are closed. So we're going to be rebroadcasting this one. So if you didn't catch something in this one, you get to watch it again. Aren't you lucky? But uh, we'll, see. we'll see how things go. I just lost my houseboat deal, and the circumstances are incredible. I'll have to fill you in later.